Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and welcome to the fifth installment of my series regarding the history of hurricanes striking Louisiana. So in this episode, we're going to chronicle the 19 hurricanes that struck Louisiana in the years 1966 to 2005, and also highlight some important near misses and tropical storms that heavily impacted the state. One of the things to note in this episode is that in the last 50 years, the science of hurricanes has improved immensely, meaning we know far more about these storms than ones in the past, as well as the fact that the access to first-hand accounts and archival footage of the events has increased as well, meaning we know way more about a Category 1 hurricane making landfall in Louisiana now than we know about major hurricanes making landfall even 100 years ago. Also, the growth of the state's population in its more hurricane-prone areas means that the higher likelihood of major damage from a storm can occur, but also the advent of large-scale evacuations, something that will become a recurring theme later in this episode and moving forward. An honorable mention goes to Hurricane Camille, which just missed the Louisiana coast on its way to striking the Mississippi Gulf Coast as a Category 5 hurricane in August of 1969. While the storm did just miss the state uh, at the lower Mississippi Delta, the Mississippi Delta itself took a hard hit with a 16-foot storm surge and a portion of the storm surge causing some minor flooding to the lower Ninth Ward, where levees were still being repaired after Hurricane Betsy in 1965. Hurricane Edith was the next storm to strike Louisiana after Betsy and did so in 1971. So at one time, it was a Category 5 storm that had struck Central America, and on its way to Louisiana, it passed over the Yucatan Peninsula and the northern Mexican coast before making a hard turn to the northeast and sped toward the state, making landfall in Western Vermilion Parish as a Category 2 storm. So in addition to wind damage, Edith spawned several tornadoes, the worst of which was an F3 that struck Baton Rouge. So the rest of the 1970s saw the state hit by multiple storms, with their impacts being relatively minor compared to previous hurricanes. In September of 1974, Carmen struck the state at the Atchafalaya Delta as a Category 3 major hurricane, but within 12 hours had already degraded to a tropical storm. So it dealt a crippling blow to the sugar industry for that year, just as grinding season was beginning. But weatherwise, the state was spared the flooding seen in Alabama by the storm. 1977 saw Babe make landfall at Cocodri as a minimal hurricane, and two years later, Bob did the same after striking Grand Isle. The state went eight years without a hurricane strike, but 1985 made up for that with two hurricanes hitting the state over the course of six weeks. So the first was Danny, which struck Grand Chenier as a Category 1 storm. So this storm is notable to me because really it was the first hurricane I remember experiencing. Juan, on the other hand, was a bit more memorable to more people because of its erratic path and widespread flooding at the end of October. So Juan nearly made landfall as a Category 1 hurricane near Intracoastal City when it suddenly looped just off the coast and made landfall at Morgan City. Over the next 24 hours, Juan made a another loop, this time over Lafayette, weakening into a tropical storm. Back in the Gulf, Juan skipped across the Mississippi Delta before making its final landfall at Gulf Shores, Alabama. Juan dropped 10 inches more of rain across the southern part of the state with nearly 18 inches falling in Galliano. Florence proved to be the final hurricane strike of the 1980s, making landfall in the Mississippi Delta before rapidly dissipating over the southeastern part of the state in September of 1988. Fast forward to 1992, and that hurricane season was dominated by Hurricane Andrew, which was the first Category 5 hurricane to make landfall in the United States since Hurricane Camille in 1969. So after it obliterated the Miami suburb of Homestead, Florida with 160 mile an hour sustained winds, Andrew crossed Florida and entered the Gulf of Mexico as a Category 4 storm. While remaining a Category 4, it strengthened slightly to 145 mile an hour sustained winds in the Gulf, but as it turned northwest toward Louisiana, it weakened into a Category 3 hurricane with 115 mile an hour winds at landfall near Morgan City. Andrew spurred nearly 1.3 million people to evacuate vulnerable areas in the southern part of the state, including 200,000 in New Orleans following the mandatory evacuation order. Even though it wasn't as catastrophic as in Florida, the damage in Louisiana was extensive, including multiple schools used as shelters that lost their roofs in the storm. In addition, Andrews spawned several tornadoes, including an F3 that struck Laplace, Louisiana, near New Orleans. But the one thing I do remember from Hurricane Andrew was a nearby radio tenor had a guide wire like those holding there snapped during the storm. And my big memory of it was watching it swing in the wind like it was a string, a true example of the power of a hurricane. 
By the time it was all said and done, Hurricane Andrew was the first hurricane to cause over a billion dollars in insurance damages to the state of Louisiana, the sign of things to come over the next two plus decades for the state. After Andrew, the rest of the 1990s and into the early 2000s was relatively calm in terms of hurricanes, with only Danny in 1997 cutting across the Mississippi Delta as a Category 1 storm on its way to Alabama. However, a trend in slow-moving tropical storms dropping over a foot of rain across sections of the state began. Francis put 22.4 inches just outside of New Orleans in 1998. Allison may have submerged Houston, but it also drenched most of the South Louisiana with over a foot of rain and over two and a half feet in Thibodeau in 2001. And the next year, Isidore dropped 15 inches in Metairie. In the case of Isidore, all that rainfall provided an unexpected benefit to the state. Because not a week after Isidore made landfall, Hurricane Lily had already plowed through Jamaica and the Cayman Islands, and once in the Gulf of Mexico, it strengthened into a Category 4 hurricane. Lily was taking aim at Acadiana, an area that had not experienced a direct hit from a major hurricane in recorded history. So as Lily approached the coast, however, it dramatically weakened due to wind shear and all the runoff from Isidore drastically cooling the Gulf waters, robbing the storm of the thermal energy fuel it needed. Lily still made landfall as a minimal Category 1 hurricane near Intracoastal City in Eastern Vermilion Parish, but the damage inflicted on the region paled in comparison to what might have happened. The 2005 hurricane season was by any objective astounding. 28 named storms, 15 of them hurricanes, seven of them major hurricanes, and four of those seven hit Category 5 status. Then on top of it, the last storm of the season lasted until 2006. It was like the season would never end. So Louisiana dodged the early season storms, apart from Hurricane Cindy making landfalls a minimum Category 1 in July, but Katrina would more than make up for that. Hurricane Katrina was initially an unremarkable hurricane that struck just north of Miami as a Category 1 storm, but once it passed over Florida and hit the hot waters of the loop current in the Gulf of Mexico, it exploded in strength with 175 mile an hour sustained winds. It quickly became apparent that New Orleans could face a direct hit and the city and state faced the nightmare scenario that had been in their planners' minds since Hurricane Betsy in 1965. New Orleans had its first mandatory evacuation, but tens of thousands of residents crowded into the Louisiana Superdome looking for a refuge of last resort. And even that, the National Weather Service's own warnings predicted apocalyptic damage to the city and surrounding areas. Hurricane Katrina weakened as it nears land and made landfall first near Buras on the Mississippi Delta as a Category 3 hurricane with 125 miles sustained winds. So the storm just missed New Orleans but slammed St. Bernard and Plaquemines parishes with an estimated storm surge of over 14 feet, wiping out coastal communities and leaving behind tens of thousands of residents homeless. St. Tammany Parish, north and east of New Orleans, experienced similar damage with a storm surge reaching nearly 20 feet in places. New Orleans briefly breathed a sigh of relief as they thought they had narrowly escaped a direct hit. But as the day went on, over 50 levee breaches throughout the city, the worst of which at the Industrial Canal, the 17th Street Canal, and the London Avenue Canal, causing flooding even worse than Betsy in 1965. Over 80% of all homes in the city were flooded, thousands made homeless, and the largest search and rescue effort in U.S. history brought an estimated 50,000 people to safety. Even 16 years later, while the lawsuits and recriminations continue, Louisiana and the federal government are still spending tens of billions of dollars to rebuild levees and mitigate storm surge risk. Through wetlands restoration, such as the closing of the Mississippi Gulf River outlet, the cause of much of the flooding in New Orleans and the surrounding areas. As the nation was fixated on the post-Katrina disaster, in New Orleans, the southwest corner of the state stared down its own apocalyptic scenario less than a month later as Hurricane Rita took aim at the Texas-Louisiana border. Rita followed a similar path to Katrina, but without a Florida landfall. It too went through intense rapid intensification, peaking at 180 mile an hour sustained winds as it passed over the Gulf Loop. But steering mechanics pushed it further to the west. Spurred on by the damage in New Orleans, Houston and the entire region here underwent the largest evacuation at the time in U.S. history. Rita weakened as it approached land and made landfall to the west of here at Johnson Bayou and Cameron Paris with 115 mile an hour sustained winds. Lake Charles received extensive wind damage as did the rest of the western part of the state. But the storm surge was the true disaster. It reached 18 feet here in Cameron and almost completely inundated every square foot of the parish. Cameron, Johnson Bayou, Grand Chenier and Holly Beach were all wiped out. 
To the east, communities that were not expecting such a large storm surge were put underwater, and multiple levee failures in Terrebonne Parish flooded tens of thousands. New Orleans was flooded again, the 14th time by my count, because emergency repairs to the levee breaches were still taking place. The combination of Katrina and Rita altered Louisiana in really so many ways. So the state was confronted with the fact that its coastline was rapidly eroding. Coastal communities like here had ridden out previous storms, were completely depopulated, and those who stayed were forced to put their homes high in the air. The resulting population shifts left the North Shore region in the New Orleans metro area and Baton Rouge in endless gridlock as their roads were unprepared for the new residents. And those evacuated from New Orleans who never returned caused demographic shifts that ultimately cost the state a congressional seat at the 2010 census. And that's the end of episode five in this six part series. So in our final episode, we're gonna look at the last 15 years of hurricanes hitting the state with an emphasis on the 2020 season, which just passed, which somehow managed to top 2005 in terms of storms and damage and trauma and all of that stuff. But before that, I was wondering, what was your first hurricane memory? Or do you have any notable experience from any of the hurricanes in this episode or a family story from any of the previous hurricanes in previous episodes? If you do, share them in the comments below. And with that, I'll see you next time, and thanks for watching.